DC brushed motors have long been used in motion control. These are just two examples of their many types and sizes. To show the construction of this motor, we'll begin by removing the end cap. A waterproof seal protects the insides. Since it was part of a velocity control system, this motor has a feedback device. We've prepped this motor for disassembly. Please note that most of the steps we're about to take will actually destroy it. The faceplate is held on by bolts that span the motor's length. Wave washers are incorporated to allow rotor in play, extending the life of the motor. The two very large permanent magnets mounted just inside the casing pose a formidable challenge for the dismantler. The faceplate bolts lie in the gaps between the magnets. The markings on the inside surface of the magnets are from machining, they're not functional. The two magnet construction makes this a two-pole motor. Returning to the end bell, we've loosened screws, cut wires, and removed the mil-spec connector. After the coupling between it and the motor shaft has been loosened, the feedback device can be lifted out and detached by undoing the three half-turn fasteners holding it to its mounting. This is one of several feedback devices used with servo motors. These are the brushes that ride on the commutator, providing current to the motor windings. By removing the metal plates on the sides of the end bell, we get access to the brush assemblies and can take out the spring that holds the brush against the commutator, as well as the brush itself. It's an easily replaceable block of graphite with a braided cable. The carbon dust is a result of brush wear. At this end of the rotor is one of its two bearings, typically ABEC 3 or equivalent quality. The other bearing is next to the commutator. The position of the brushes relative to the commutator is called the commutation angle. This end of the shaft has been reduced to accept the feedback coupling. The rotor windings, which lie within its laminations, all lead to the commutator. They're prevented from shorting out to each other or to the laminations by this gray insulation material and by the clear enamel that coats each wire. Many wires run through each of these slots. These copper bars form the commutator of a larger motor. Notice that each segment is insulated from the rest, as well as from the rotor shaft. Each is L-shaped and soldered to the windings here at the top of the L. Though this motor appears different, its design is identical. The windings run in slots in the rotor, each strand coated with enamel, and each slot lined with an insulated sleeve to protect the coated wires from the metal walls. Note the individual laminates that form the rotor. On this smaller rotor, they're angled or skewed. This permits the motor to run smoother, but at the cost of torque. This particular rotor uses a four-pole stator. Notice the four magnets, instead of two. This also increases smoothness, but this time at the cost of top speed. These kinds of trade-offs are typical of brushed motors. There's variety in brushed DC motors. This pancake motor rotor is actually a printed circuit card etched to form windings. The two brushes run here on either side, and the magnets lie alongside. There are many variations on this low inertia design. What happens if a brushed DC motor stops? The current still flows from one brush through one coil to the other brush, and the heat this creates must be dissipated. Its thermal path is through the laminations of the rotor across the air gap through the stator magnets and the motor casing. This long thermal path limits the power a brushed motor can put out without melting its windings.